I know a lot of people are talking about this right now, but it is very funny that Gen Z is obsessed with dressing like it's the 1990s. I remember begging my mom to buy me clothes from the Delia's <laughs> magazine, and she was like, absolutely no. But after she had a couple of martinis at lunch, I could sometimes sway her into the limited two for a couple of outfits. In the third grade, which for your reference was 1993, I asked my brother if I could wear his flannel shirt and big baggy khaki shorts to school. I had just chopped off all my hair that summer, which I wasn't too sure if I liked or not. And honestly, I don't know why I did it. Like every time you cut your hair, you totally regret it. And as a, you know, eight-year-old, I was suffering (laughs) because of a rash decision. Um, I paired his outfit with my beat-up Vans and threw my blue Jansport on and rode my bike to school. And I got to be honest with you, I was worried. I was like, oh my God, I'm an imposter. I knew I was playing a part, the part of a cool, genderqueer, punkish kid that was into Nirvana, and that was just definitely not me. I was obsessed with TLC, Tupac, Mary J. Blige, but I had gained a couple of pounds that summer, and my body was just figuring out what it wanted to be, and I couldn't wear limited to crop shirts and fitted gap jeans like the other long-legged skinny girls. And so it began my dual life, trying to fit in as a tomboy because my body was thick and strong, but desperately starving myself to be thin and wafy because, let's be honest, it was the 90s and being thin and wafy was what feminine meant, and that is what I really felt. I've never met a sparkle or a lipstick or a dress I didn't like and that I didn't want to wear, and that's what I wanted, but I would see in the media that skinny meant pretty, and skinny meant girl, and skinny meant feminine, and I was stuck on the fucking playground being called fat in a refrigerator, so that wasn't me. When I first started to date women, I felt free. I had slept with plenty of women and kissed them and sexualized them, but the idea of taking Like that part of myself out of the closet and going out on a date or like talking on the phone and doing all of those things that meant dating was incredibly scary for me. I was like 25 and I met a girl in the bathroom off of a club in the mission, off of Valencia, I think it was. And I just, I like completely fell in love. It was wild. And I wanted to date her. I wanted to marry her. I wanted to have all of her children. (laughs) But, you know, some of my guy friends at the time and actually some of my band members were like, well, now you just date women and you are a lesbian. But that didn't necessarily feel right. It felt like I was negating so many crushes, so much love for like two guys. (laughs) Because men are mostly trash. Um... But it was hard for me. Like, I moved to L.A. and people, you know, I was dating girls mostly. And they'd be like, oh, you're a lesbian. I'm like, but, like, I am, but I'm not. And at that time, you know, the language we only really had was kind of these, like, binaries, bisexual, lesbian, gay, et cetera. And gender fluid and queer well, I hadn't really had the reclaiming that it does now. I met Jen Winston via Zoom last year, right before her book, Greedy, Notes from a Bisexual Who Wants Too Much, launched. I was so intrigued, but if I'm being honest, I was incredibly envious because she wrote such a personal and honest and really an incredible book that demonstrated the bisexual experience. I haven't really met many folks that identify with being bisexual for long periods of time. Like me trying grunge for a day, being bisexual has been portrayed in the media as a crossover drug and a gay addiction or something you did at Smith College for a semester and that was it. It's never been like a lifetime identity or a badge of honor. It's like, you know, a quick pit stop versus a long journey. And I love Jen. I loved that she felt so proud to be bisexual and that she really wanted to explore it. And I really liked her. So we kept in contact and she's since moved to Los Angeles with her fiance. And I wanted to catch up with her about life after her incredible book and uh, what it's like to be a bicon. 
Do you feel any different as a bisexual now that you're engaged? Um, I don't know. It's nice. Um, I'm excited. I, I have never really been like that excited to plan a wedding. I've been excited to like buy a wedding dress specifically. Um, and I am very excited to do that. But I recently went to one of my best friend's weddings and it was wonderful or my best friend's wedding and it was wonderful and it made me really excited to plan my own because it was just like a, a beautiful event and I I feel like the people who do who do it that way like understand the purpose of a wedding like to try to just curate a beautiful experience for everyone and have a great party so that's what I that's what I want to do I have I have no other plans we have no other plans but I'm in control of it because Ford does not want to deal with it that's really lucky I didn't have that Rachel was definitely involved we got we were together a really long time but we the time between being engaged and married was only about five months Mm. and we wow just had like a big party yeah that sounds so fun yeah what'd you do We got married at my aunt's house, which was lovely. My parents got married there as well. We didn't have any bridesmaids. or I had like my nieces and nephews kind of pretend to be the flower children, um, but they were just sort of like cranky and tired as kids (laughs) are. But we, you know, my friend made my dress for me. Like we just, we kept it pretty chill. We had a big raw oyster bar and we played rap music and- Great. Like I ate chocolate cake because I didn't want a white one and it was great. And yeah, like, or you seven a white cake. I guess. That's weird. I guess you are. We were just like, fuck it. I will say yeah. it, what was what was funny is um and I don't really bring this up, but you're the perfect person to bring this up to. And that's why I asked, do you feel different as a bisexual woman? Um, or person, I should say. Um I don't know anymore. Who yeah, knows? sorry. Um, <laughs> no, it's okay. I, I, I'm, I have no, I truly have no idea. For like, there was a period of time when I was like, I am not a woman. And now I'm like, oh, maybe I am. I have no idea. It's the beauty of so, today. It's the beauty exactly, of today. And yes. by the way, it's the beauty of it being your fucking choice to yep. be whatever you yes, want to be. Yes, true. But um, I did have a few people, and I think some of the questions were earnest. You know, these hetero predominantly white um, male identifying folks were like, does this make you still bisexual now that you're married to somebody who identifies as a woman? And I'm like, yes, dude, when you married your spouse, wife, does it mean that your like sexuality just went to die? No, right? Like, what? it's so funny. I hope you don't get those questions. I feel like you won't. No, I don't. Maybe you will. But I don't because I wrote like, an entire book on it. So it's like pretty hard for people to be like, are you still bisexual? Because I'm like, yes, professionally, I have to still be bisexual. So they can't. How does that feel? You and I spoke like right when the book came out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. About a year ago. Yep. I, of course, got like very emotional because I was like, I remember talking to bisexual people. I know. I love you. I love you too. It was great. It was a great (laughs) conversation. What is it like a year later being kind of like professionally and personally one of the biggest kind of bicons mm. there is? Well, okay. So I will just share that. I'll share this because I'm trying to share it with everyone, especially people who have books coming out or who want to write books, is that I got really, really depressed after like we probably talked two weeks after my book came out and I was like, go, go, go for like a month doing the press tour. And then I was just super depressed until like June. And apparently that's very normal. Like I've talked to several other author friends who feel that, but no one prepares you for it. And it's kind of because it takes like you, you think that like the day your book comes out, everyone's going to have read it. And like under, you know, you think, that means your words are out in the world and everyone has like immediately synthesized them. But it takes people obviously quite a while to read a book. People don't read very much. And, you know, it, it takes time for it to like make its way around. But I was just expecting like my first week of sales to be like, OK, I'm going to get options like uh, which actually was I don't even want it to be optioned for because I'm trying to sell it 
a pilot and like a series that I had more of a role in adapted from it. But that's another story. Uh, that's the thing that brought me out of the depression, actually, was working on that that uh, adaptation. But it it's something people don't prepare you for. And I think it's probably true for lots of if you put a lot of time and energy into like a creative project, even at a wedding. I've heard it similar things about weddings that are like planned, like if it's if it becomes a full time job for like a year and you're planning a wedding and you put your heart and soul into it and then it happens, it's like, OK, now what? And I felt a lot of now what? And I didn't really know what to do. I was like, I'm not going to talk about bisexuality for the rest of my life. Like, am I? Maybe. <laughs> maybe I am. Um, but eventually. Like I felt like I was also getting really nice messages from people and I just, they wouldn't, I couldn't absorb them for some reason. Like mm. I kept screenshotting them because I was like, someday you're going to need this boost. Um, and I'm glad I did because now I can kind of look back and be like, oh, this is really nice. Um, sometimes my partner will like read me my nice Amazon reviews, which is really sweet. Oh, I love that. A nice Amazon review. It's nice to have somebody yes. else do it for you so that you don't like focus on the one negative one or like so you don't sort by one star and like find those, you know, which is what I would do. Um, uh, tr are you kidding me? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> are you I talking mean, to a cancer with like um i'm like such an emotional puddle i always go and look at the bad ones and i me too just, i'm also I, like oh and then i go and i i look for those people i like yeah, find them on the internet same i do that too so which is like people should know if they're gonna write either of us a bad review that we are going to like find, find where you. they live and like mm -hmm. their second cousin but recently i had a moment that made me it, it was like the moment I was expecting when the book first came out on Bi Visibility Day this year. I was approached by this organization in San Francisco called the Optimist Collective. Uh, they'd done some work with one of my brilliant friends, Joanna Miller, who's a life coach. And they'd done these like retreats. And they, they, they were like a wellness curating organization, but they're bi owned, and which is like the first time I've ever he really heard anybody call a business that is like saying that it's, it's, it was women owned, bi owned, and they approached me about doing a few bi visibility day events. And one of those was like a speaking event at the San Francisco LGBTQ Center. Another was a writing workshop at a wine bar that was also a bisexual wine bar named after a famous bisexual poet. Where? In San Francisco? Yeah. It, it's called Malay. What? It was, it's a sick establishment. Highly, highly recommend. Um, but it's named after the poet Edna St. Vincent Millay, I think. I, I don't know. But um, it, who was apparently famously bisexual. And those events were so incredible because it was I, it was like I could see the impact of the book. I also didn't get to do an in-person book tour because of COVID. Uh, and so it, it felt like. Why don't we do one that, here? I mean, yeah. I, Why don't I'm, we do a party? We, sh we should. I do a lot of stuff with Skylight. So I hope to do something with them in the near future, like in person. But I've done a few virtual events with them. But yeah, we sh I, at, at, that's the bare minimum. But I'm just yeah, saying. I, yeah. I'm, I'm, it'll be an engagement party first. I'm more excited to okay. do that because I've okay. sort of mentally moved on from like planning book events. But it was just so nice to to like be in bisexual spaces and have like talk talk to people who had read the book and and some who hadn't and who were bisexual and just like looking for ways to learn more and one woman at the LGBTQ center event she was like in her 60s i think and she raised her hand to tell me that in during the Q&A, she was like, I don't have a question, but I do want to say that uh, I've been doing bi activism work for a very long time. And I'm really impressed by the sources that you cited in your book. And I was like, oh, my God, Whoa. that is the greatest compliment ever. Like, I never thought I would get that compliment. So she she said she had in san francisco, in san francisco in san francisco let me tell you exactly you're right you're right as makes it as somebody who's 
born and raised from San Francisco when those oh, yes. like elders come for you. Yeah. And you then and it's from a positive place and they're giving you praise. That's the highest praise. Yeah. It's it yeah. I I felt it. Wait, where in San Francisco are you from? Well, I grew up um, first in the marina and then we moved to Marin, but I went to school in the marina. But like I was a ragtag ragamuffin child running all over San Francisco my whole life. So yeah. the city, I really felt no bounds. I lived in the Richmond for a long time off of Fulton Street on the way to the ocean right by the Buffalo uh, in the park. Um, I, d- I don't, I don't know, know what that is. Yeah, but. no, I could like get real city. I could get real city with you, Jen, if you want to. But yeah, no, I, I grew up in the city. And yeah, and I think, you know, it was so funny because for me, when I was really exploring my, I th- think I've always been bisexual. Like there was never a time when I didn't have crushes on people who identified as boys and girls. And you yeah. know what I mean? Like in everything in between, right? Yeah. I've always just been like really crush heavy. I still get crushes on people, you Yeah. Know? And but I wish there was a bisexual bar in San Francisco in the yeah. You know what I mean? I totally would have gone because I felt, you know, back then for me, I would like go to the Lexington by myself. And for those listening, the Lexington was like an OG lesbian bar in the mission. It was amazing. But I just didn't really feel welcomed there. But I would go mm-hmm. and like just fucking grit and bear it or I ended up really meeting other bisexual women at swinger parties. Like that was the Mm -hmm. only kind of outlet for me was in this construct of like couples. And so I would either be in a couple at the time with my boyfriend and we would like sort of swap or like the girls would kind of go off. Or when I broke up with him, I would end up like going by myself and what we were deemed, you know, it seems so like weird in 90s, but like unicorns. We were like, the kind of single yeah. oh, bisexual yeah, yeah, yeah. girls that were like into it. And it's so interesting now when I speak to like younger folks, you know, especially those that, you know, from a gender perspective identify as being um, women who are queer. It, they really sort of, for me, the conversations will either say they're omnisexual or they're pansexual, but they still, that younger yeah. generation still shies away from bisexuality and i'm finding in my sort of older age like finally being like no fuck that like i am bisexual yeah. i don't i mean have you now that you wrote a whole book about being bisexual do you still really identify with being bisexual what's like the conversation with being pan like for yeah. you or how do people relate to you in that way too i mean people love to bring that up. Um, I definitely still really, I definitely, (laughs) no, 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 not. And I don't mean bisexual, like it's, it's not normally bisexual people who are bringing it up. It's normally, honestly, it's normally like straight people who are like, of course, what it, yeah. Uh, who are like, well, what about being pan? Like bi means too. And I'm, that was part of the reason I wrote the book in the first place was because I was like so sick of answering that question. And also because I wanted to like really figure out what bisexuality meant for me that wasn't within the binary. And I like the process of writing the book really helped me understand that, that bisexuality was is really like a gateway to this in between space and like not necessarily choosing the options that are presented to you. I definitely still identify very much as bi. Thank God. Can you imagine if I if I didn't? Uh, it well, would be. I mean, you never know. I know. Like, fuck it. I mean, yeah. whatever. Honestly, if you came on here and you're like, Liz, I don't. I don't yeah. identify as bi. I'd be like, not okay. Yeah. <laughs> you know I, I mean, mean uh, right. Uh, whatever. Like, yeah. I. I don't know. I, it would be hard though. I would have to walk back. My like, it w- it would just be a difficult. Difficult conversation every time my book came up. So I'm very glad I still do. But I think it's more that like I see bisexuality now as less of a sexuality and more of like a lens to look at the world and to kind of find those in between spaces, find those. I, I like to say that it's bisexuality is about finding stability in a state of flux. And so mm. I that could mean literally whatever, whatever you need it to mean. So it's become like I used to fear the word similar to how I think you're referencing people do and did. Um, 
now I love the word and I've made it so much more a part of my life because the meaning touches everything for me now. So that's very nebulous, but maybe it answers. No, 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 no. It does. I mean, it's just interesting. Like I'm, I think you and I have talked about this and many bisexual people have talked about, you know, bi erasure and Mm -hmm. kind of how the more visible we are, the more important it is. And I would be totally lying to you if I didn't say when people ask me like, oh, you're with a woman or you're a lesbian or, you know, and I sometimes will call myself a lesbian just because I'm like, Mm -hmm. oh, yeah, I'm gay or because I one, I fucking can. Yeah, and two, yeah, absolutely. because sometimes it like feels right to me. But I would be lying if I said that in some certain situations and I want to transition sort of into this other duality kind of life that I think you and I both lead that I felt so reflected in you when I met you in a second. But I do get like a little like, oh, I'm bisexual. Like it feels like I'm I think because bisexuality, yeah. maybe because the word sex yeah. is there, I feel like I'm explaining like how I like to fuck. Yeah, like, totally. It, you know what I mean? And it's so intense. Like even I was at my work conference last week and someone's like, oh yeah, you're a lesbian. I'm like, well, I'm bisexual. And even in that moment, it's like, why am I feeling yeah. like I'm I'm explaining a dirty little secret? I know. You know what I mean? I, I have always felt that way. And I think part of the reason I put it off for so long is because I was worried that I would be like telling my coworkers that I liked having threesomes, which was true. So I was like, I'm, I should just not say that because then I'll just be like <laughs> confirming the obvious. So yeah, it, I, it's, I, I have a feeling that a lot of it has to do with the term sex being in the word. A lot of it also just has to do with the fact that we see it as a behavior rather than an identity when bisexuality is shown on, TV or in movies, it's often performed. It's not like people will come out as bisexual or like say that they're bi. It, it, instead, you'll see someone like hook up with someone of one gender and then like cheat on them with someone from another gender, usually. Totally. And then you're like supposed to infer like, oh, that person's bisexual. But because they don't use the word bisexuality, all we get from that is seeing the behavior associated with bisexuality. So then it, the whole thing becomes about sex. And then by the same coin, if you haven't like had done that behavior yet, which I hadn't, I didn't feel like I was I, like I deserve to call myself bisexual. So right. I remember that in your book. Yeah, yeah. that w- that's tough. Right. And I sort of if I'm being honest with you felt the same because I had like only sort of been with guys in high Mm -hmm. school or whatever it was but i'm like wait no i like really want to fuck dj tanner from full house (laughs) yeah who like yeah shockingly ended up being like such a weird right wing like what whoa i didn't even yeah candace burn whatever yes because her candace cameron because her brother kirk cameron remember is like crazy yeah they're like crazy religious oh my gosh what a vibe kill let me tell you what a vibe kill. I, I recently, let's see, I've been reflecting on like past childhood, like sexual awakenings. And I realized for me, most of them were like hot cartoons, <laughs> which is so really? weird. Like Kim Possible. I was like, oh, gorgeous. Kim Possible? How <laughs> old are you? I guess I, w- I was like, I was like, let's see, when did that show come out? I'm 34. So I was like, okay, so I'm a couple years. I, so you were going into high school as I was going out of high school. Yeah, but I'm I like, was still too possible. old to be saying to be. Okay, saying. that makes more yeah, sense. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, I love anything with high quality CBD in it, and I recently tried Plantwise Relax and Rest to help with some of my sleep issues. After a friend told me she's been getting the best sleep of her life after using it for a month. It has really effective natural ingredients that don't knock you out or make you feel groggy in the morning. I love it. Gets me the best night's sleep I've ever had. Go to getplantwise.com and use code listen to liz 20 for 20% off. Something that you and I share is that we both sort of straddle being creatives, but then having quite corporate jobs. Mm-hmm. And I don't, ever don't worry talk about my job on podcast like i never every time i'm interviewed i'm like yo you can ask me whatever you want i'm not going to talk about work and i've said that for years i've gone to different companies but it is 
an interesting thing because I feel like not only am I a bisexual, but I am mm. living a double life. Mm. And it's like last night, I'll give you a little inside track. I took these clients out to a Clippers game and I'm sitting there with like 20, 26 year old media planners. And we're chatting and they just think I'm like a loser. You know, I mean, or yeah. I don't know what they think they I am, but like I think they the kind of entertain. They don't know. That yeah, they like think they're a, like, I'm yeah. the rep. You know what I mean? Like, I'm not cool, whatever. And somebody that was with me there that works with me knows me and is like, oh, no, no, no. Like, you know, like Liz has like a podcast like Liz, like, you know, whatever, it, you know, writes and was a producer. And, blah. and they all look at me kind of crazy eyed. And I think to, and I kind of then. When I'm at my own work, I have to be like, well, you know, I have a podcast. And then when I am in my yeah. weird podcasting space, I have to be like, well, you know, I have this like insane corporate job, which is why I can't make fucking TikToks all day. Yeah. Do same. you feel that way too? Is that the same? <laughs> oh, Do you feel like literally. you're like bisexual, bi working, bi creator yes. all the time? Well, I'm actually really glad you brought that up. So um, at the Optimist Collective events, we, I guess they often start like as part of the Optimist Collective's approach, they start events with a question and they have people like talk about the question with each other. And so I got to come up with the questions for each of our events. And so for one of them, we had the question be like, think about which labels you have in your life that have been useful to you. Obviously it's like seeding the idea of like bisexual is a useful label for me, but it could also be like <laughs> rebel or like Libra. That one's another one useful to me. Person with ADHD, another one useful to me. Um, or like creative director or like strategist, you know, things like that. And then our other question was, uh, this was in the writing workshop. So they got to write, a, write about it. And it was like, discuss like a binary, like a, a place in your life when you straddle two worlds. And that was one of the examples given was like corporate versus creative or something like that. So it really is like so real. I feel lucky that finally I am a creative director at Lyft and my, which is not what I was doing a year ago when we first talked, but now I can, I mean, I don't know. I don't know how much I can talk about it, but, but I, I will just only say good things because I have some good things to say right now that I get, I'm creative director for social specifically. And so theoretically I am supposed to be making TikToks all day. So I feel very lucky that I finally found a job where my personal experience and like passions for like making content is part of my professional skill. And so like, when I've heard the story that like when I when they decided to hire me, the teams were like, oh, let's see, like, let's see if this person is a good hire for creative director of social. So like it was important that I had my own platforms to get this job, which is really interesting in just the way that like the way that things are going. We also work. I work with so many people who have their own massive content platforms. I just found out someone that I work with who uh, has like does drag on the side, has a massive TikTok following. Didn't know that. And it's like, this would actually help everyone be better at their jobs. So I wish we just were able to really bring those authentic selves to work. The, the idea of like, bring your authentic self to work. I'm pretty sure I used to work at Facebook Meta. And uh, that was like something they told you at orientation, like bring your authentic self to work. And I think a lot of tech does that. But it's like, you can only you can only do that so much, but everything would be better if we could just if we were able to really do that and to like put value on things people did outside of their typical scope or yeah. I've experienced a lot of like jealousy and people being really weird with mm. me if I'm just being honest. Like do you know what I mean? like I've had people be really Weird. I've also had people be so supportive. My boss right now, like, he loves it. You know, I yeah, mean, he's just good. the best. He fucking loves it. And it is really great. But it does, it has gotten weird. I don't, you know, I work so much on the business side now, which is so crazy because I started my career in creative. But, you know, I, it, it does feel very, like there is a huge chasm between those two worlds for me because I'm mm -hmm. not, you know, making social 
at work, but I do, I, I, it's funny, like I, when recently, I think just because I'm getting more confident and kind of who I am and I'm getting older and all of the all of these things. But I I sort of did have somebody push back on me recently that I work with who doesn't really know me. But he he sort of was like, well, I don't get why you get to do these things. And why and I looked at him, I'm like, because I work my fucking yeah. ass off yeah. in both worlds. And they don't compete, they complement. And the reality of it is like I work in entertainment from the business side, but I'm really, really enmeshed in creator culture. And it really helps. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like I'm a nerd. Like I'm the kid that like read every time I bought a CD at Amoeba on fucking Hate Street, I would open it up and literally line by line see who like played the fucking triangle. Yeah. Like I wanted to know every creative that, yeah. you know, was involved. And I think like that's how I figured out who Roy Hargrove was, who was incredible, who played on like Erica Badu Mama's mm -hmm. Gun. Like, he ended up like becoming this whole big thing. So when he came around, I'm like, oh, I've been known about Roy. You know, yeah. I'm like, what? You know, I mean, I think like, but it's just, it, it's funny. I don't have a lot of people that I can talk to that sort of like either work in tech or like, you know, these large companies that, you know, have a bi big brand identity. Yeah. I always kind of tend, and so do you, where then we sort of also have our own brand identities. I mean, I don't have what, like a, a couple hundred thousand followers. Nobody gives a shit about, I mean, my, they do. I have like the loveliest, yes, you amazing do. listenership is, that just is the best. Yeah, like, I mean, com the them. community of it all is so important. And I don't even like know what I'm trying to do with my, I, I Instagram exhausts me. If I hadn't gotten this job as a like, where my entire job is about social, I probably would have deleted all my socials. No I was like, way. I you was would very, have. I was very, very close to doing that, um, at least for a little but you were, while. But you, I feel like on Instagram for a while, especially before the book came, I mean, I can't imagine how much time and effort. And you were really yeah. like educating the fucking internet about bisexuality, which yeah. is- so that's a big job. That's and a big job to it, take on. Exactly. And honestly, like today is election day and I know I should have posted something, but I am just so tired because working, working, I mean, I've been posting like voting guides. I should at least share a voting guide. But it's it's hard because people tell you like having a platform is like a responsibility. And it's like, yeah, but like I don't make any money from it. Literally none. I don't get free stuff from it. It's like it didn't like rocket my book sales to bestseller lists. You know, it doesn't. In fact, it probably like discredited me a little bit because it made me look like it, like at least my agent even said that she thought it was just like an influencer book. She didn't realize I wanted it to be good. And I was like, no, I would like the book to be good. Like I'm a writer. Like, what? <laughs> so I think it did like shoot me in the foot in a few ways, but you know, it's not like, I guess it's, it's currency. I'm not going to like say I don't want this because I did build it, but it's not. I'm so tired by all of it. And I'm I can't even bring myself to like I feel like I burnt myself out so much in the Trump years of like advocacy and just like making resources. And I I literally can't even begin to to try to to chime in on current events right now. Like I'm, I'm just- Don't worry, I did it for us. I already had <laughs> yeah. everybody on my fucking ass about Rick Caruso. I'm like, oh, dude, if yeah. Rick Caruso wanted to change Los Angeles, he could have fucking done it. it if he's running on a platform of wealth and connections, he very well could have done that previously. But anyway, I don't no, worry. Yeah. Me and Bobby Hundreds, shout out to Bobby. We were- uh, we were Oh, you really went on- hard on the Oh, internet. that's nice. I'll listen to that. I mean, I- yeah, a friend told me I was like, I because I had just moved to LA, so I was like, "What should I do uh, on the ballot?" And he was like, "Here's what you do: you Google DSA Los Angeles, and you <laughs> follow everything on their voter guide." And I was like, "Yep." And their voter guide is actually super comprehensive, and it like uh, it breaks down the why, and it breaks down when there's not a good candidate for certain things, and it explains the propositions really well. So that was great. And I also went to a benefit for. Hugo Soto Martinez a few weeks ago, mm. which was a great, it was like hosted by John Early. It was wonderful. And I learned a lot about city council in California. I guess I am 
this is energizing me a little I, bit. I, yeah, I was going to say, you sound like you're doing a, a little something. Well, something over there. It, but I'm, I, it makes me feel so much better to like have real conversations in the real world about it than to make content about it, which is what I was doing from 2016 to 2020. There's like no, I look back at some of the stuff that I made, like I made several anti-racism resources, like specifically for other white people that were valuable resources. Like I've heard from many people that, that they were valuable, that they like helped take work away from black people doing this education, especially during like June of 2020. But I look back at them and I'm like, this is like disgusting that I thought that I needed to make this. And it's very, it's very hard to navigate because I know it was meaningful and I know there was impact, but I'm like to consider, to even consider chiming in on those conversations now, other than like amplifying voices is like wild. Like, I can't even believe that, that I did that, but I was so, I like to, something that makes me, I'm trying to learn what makes me want to write and what makes me inspired. Cause it's not, it's not very many things, but, um, Having a lot of feelings is one thing when I'm feeling a lot. And then another is when, I, when I've when i learned something new. And I think I was just learning so much at such a rapid rate between like 2016 and 2020. And I was posting all about it. And I mean, that's kind of what my book is about is that process of unlearning. But it's it's just like a different internet and an exhausted world and... um so yeah, I so it's I'm, a very different yeah. internet. It's a different internet than when you and I met a year ago. Yeah, it's that's a different true. internet than. I mean, I guess I would say this: like at least you tried to move the conversation forward. Yeah, and I can't fault anyone for learning. I think, like, listen, I don't always say the right things about queer culture. People come to me just like I'm sure they come to you, as if we're some like fucking encyclopedia. On what it's what we're supposed to do and what we're supposed to say. And I don't always say the right things. And, you know, I like horrifically I didn't know I misgendered someone that I, d I hadn't seen before the pandemic and I didn't know mm. that they had started their transition. And very quickly, I'm like, I am so sorry. I mean, we were on the phone. So it was like, you know, I, I didn't I just didn't know. Yeah. You know what I mean? And I was corrected, noted, moved on. And yeah. I'm like, shit, you know, like. I probably could have avoided that by simply checking in and saying like, you know, are your pronouns different? You know, yeah. I, there, or what pronouns even would you though me to use? I you mean, know? I, I don't know, you know? Yeah, I think that's like, obviously that's like what we should be doing. Um, but it's really, it's really hard. And I don't know why it's so hard. Like, especially when we spend so much time in those like corporate cis normative spaces. Uh, which like almost every space, I guess, is this normative. And un unfortunately, it's like really difficult. Like I, I told myself when I started at Lyft, I would say my pronouns in every meeting. I don't think I've done that like since I started in May. And there's not even a way like on Zoom, I can put my pronouns, but like on Google Meet, you can't. And so it's these stupid like tech things. And it's just like we can shoulder that burden individually. Yes. And like, I mean, it's, it's good that your friend corrected you and that you apologized and moved on. I've like heard that's the right thing to do, but it's also like, there's such a bigger problem of just like, how do we make those conversations less awkward? I have a problem where I only bring up pronouns when I think that someone is like, visually presenting as androgynous like well and no I'll, that's what i mean we were on yeah. the phone right and yeah. so and that in and of itself right like i have a friend mav viola who's a hysterical lesbian comedian and everybody should go listen to her i'll try to get mm. her on the show but she is super androgynous looking and i when i first met her i'm like what are your pronouns they right yeah. and i think or i think i had read in like a press thing that it was they and she's like no it's she her you're only asking me this because I have short fucking hair and yeah. I'm wearing a t-shirt. No one asks you what your pronouns are. Exactly. And I'm like, you know what? Fair yeah. enough. Fair enough. Fair enough. It It's true. It's true. And so I try to catch myself, but it like, I mean, like my partner uses he and they pronouns. So like it should be theoretically, it should be top of mind for me 
to like, like pronouns in general, I use she, her, and they, them pronouns. Like it should be part of my life, but because it's so easy for me to be read as she, her, and that doesn't like rub me the wrong way. Yeah. I just like, I give in. And for so long, I feel like I was actually fighting the good fight, but now I'm just so tired. And so I'm just like, can the world, can the the people in power just fix things, please? Can everybody vote down the DSA (laughs) working families line in New York, et cetera? Because it's just, it's too much for, for anyone's shoulder individually. And also it's like, there's very much an ego thing involved. And there, at least there was for me in thinking that I could be the one to like have, have an impact. That doesn't mean the work wasn't valuable, but I'm, so those are the things I've been processing offline and got it. Yeah. Yeah. Hard to process online. Mm -hmm. Um, one final question. What's the best thing about being bisexual? I wonder if it's the same thing. I've never been asked that. So I'm going to ask you that. I don't know. Limitless potential, I guess. Um, The world is your (laughs) oyster. Yeah. I, I feel like in my head, I'm saying like bisexual, no rules, but it's kind of, it sort of is like, yeah, I, I feel like, yeah, you can, you don't, you get to create the world for yourself. Like you get to make your own decisions based on what feels right, as opposed to what you think you're supposed to be doing. If I won the lottery, I know exactly what I would do with it. I would take the money as a whole immediately, which after taxes is like 40 to 50%. I would fix this house, pay the mortgage, put a shit ton of it in my 401k, and I would write. And I would see if I like had to have a full-time job, even though I like my job, but like I'd want a little break, but I would write. I would just write. I would write books. I would write articles. I would do this podcast. But writing is something that has always been such a solace for me. And I am so inspired talking to Jen. Listen, I like get it. You like put something out there and you don't know what's going to happen with it. And and I really appreciate her honesty about kind of feeling like a little depression and a little bit of a loss after the book comes out. But I'm so in awe of how much courage it takes to talk about your life in a book and put it out there and still maintain this corporate job. Like, honestly, Jen, to me, is a fucking hero. And it's something that I would love to do. So I don't know. Like, I don't know if I'm going to win the lottery. I don't know (laughs) if I'm ever going to stop distracting myself because I've started and I've stopped a million times writing this book sort of about my life and my journey and all the crazy shit that's happened to me. And I think this podcast is something that I started in hopes to kind of bring myself back to writing again. But thank you, Jen. You've inspired me. (laughs) I'm excited that I can look up to you and hopefully be reinvigorated. And I guess... I think there can be two books about being bisexual, right? 